everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Govs on the Go Alumni Edition, a podcast featuring alumni from the College of Arts and Letters here at Austin P. State University. My name is Dr. Buzzoon. I'm the dean of the college. I'm also the host of the podcast. Today, I'm talking with Hondra Herrera, who graduated with a degree in communication back in 2012. Hondra, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here, excited to talk about something I love, something I'm passionate about. So thank you for having me. Yeah. And uh, we we have spent some time both professionally and, and personally at different times, uh, you know, and, and, and I know you have... Uh, like very like me, a heart for sports broadcasting. And we're going to reflect upon those days at Austin P. But won't you tell everybody, um, give everybody a life update. What's going on in your life right now? Okay, yeah. Um, so currently, I am in the role of director of recruitment and orientation at Austin P. State University. Um, so, like I tell everybody, I'm like gum on the bottom of your shoe. They're not getting rid of me here. I am part of the furniture <laughs> at this point. Um, I love being at Austin P. It's, you know, I, I talk to a lot of my friends and, you know, they're, oh, man, we got to go back to work. And I'm like, I enjoy work. I don't mind work. Work is great. Um, you know, it never feels that taxing. It does have its days, but overall, it has never felt like I am going to work. Um, I think I am living in kind of a fantasy world of like, I'm a big kid that gets to go do something he enjoys every single day. Um, and I think that kind of shows in my work as well as I just have fun with it. Um, I do take it serious. I do think it's a really important role. And, and I understand that aspect. But at the end of the day, I get to come to a place where the fun is embraced um, and I get to spread that kind of energy to everybody. So I love being in this role, um, specifically doing the orientation stuff. I, I have such a big heart for uh, new student orientation and bringing students on board to Austin Peay State University. Uh, it's it's just really easy to kind of put myself in their shoes and go, I remember, I because I do remember my orientation day. I don't know why I remember my orientation day, but I do specifically remember my orientation day. I remember every aspect of the day. I remember going into the sports broadcasting studio on that day so that they could talk to us and kind of show us the area um, prior to us registering for classes in the lab right outside of there um, because I was a little pain for the advisor that day. Um, I took some classes previous to coming to college um, and thought I knew more than some people. And I was like, oh, I don't think I should sign up for this one. I, I should be ahead. And she's like, that's not how this works. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but now I get to see students in that same um, scenario and kind of being able to watch them. I'm like, yeah, you're going to do just fine here. You're, you're going to have a great time. So <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at right now as far as life. Okay, well, we'll get more uh, into your career as we uh, progress through the podcast, but um, we're going to back up and, and start in your uh, early family life. And and you talked about um, that your family was, uh, now, were you born in Nicaragua? And then so you... I am the only one of my immediate family not born in Nicaragua. My okay. mother, father, and sister were all born in Nicaragua. Okay, but your your family moved to the U.S. and and you spent a, a early part of your time kind of traveling around at different places, including other countries, uh, because your I, I think your dad was uh, in the military. Correct, correct. And yes. then um, so I always kind of think you know, do you think looking back upon that now that maybe some of that had some impact on you personally, you know, your personality? Oh yeah, no, for sure. So. Um... As I got older, I kind of understood the bigger picture there of how that kind of shaped me. But um, I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, which trying to explain to the world that somebody with the name Alejandro Herrera um, with a family from Nicaragua was born in St. Paul, Minnesota um, is kind of difficult to get there. But uh, the way we ended up in Minnesota actually was um, my father was actually in the Nicaraguan military prior to coming over to the U.S. Um, so during that time in the late 80s, early 90s, um, Nicaragua was actually at civil war, so it was not a great time in the country there. Um, he had my sister, who at the, that time um, was about one and a half, um, and he told me the story. Uh, one day he went to the store, I can use the term store very loosely during that time, um, and he was trying to get some diapers for my sister. Um, and they told him that they were all out of diapers, and it would be a couple of weeks before they had diapers again. And he, as a father, a young father at that point, um, was very, very frustrated and very emotional at that point um, and decided that they, this was it. It was time to get out of here. Um, so he started doing the paperwork to try to um, file to immigrate over to the U.S. 
um, his brother, my uncle, had already been living in um, Minnesota. And so he had a point of contact here to help him kind of through that process. Um, and due to the Civil War in Nicaragua, um, it was able to process pretty quickly. Um, and then he put me, my, or he put my mother and my sister with me ready about a couple days away, ready to, to make my appearance um, on a plane with, he said it was 50 cents in his pocket, which he didn't comprehend really how much 50 cents was. Um, and neither one of them spoke a lick of English and they just wow. got on a plane and they were like, let's, let's figure this out. Um, they arrived in Minnesota. And then two days later, I made my arrival in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, neither one of them spoke a lick of English. My aunt was there in the hospital with them so that she could kind of translate and, and navigate all of that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the story of how I arrived in the U.S. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example of your, yeah, I'm sh you're sure of your parents, um, you know, it, doing something that uh, was very challenging to them, but that, that they, they knew that this was probably the best for their family. And, and, um, and so we pick up those little subtle uh, things along the way, but th it wasn't the first. You also, as you, as you mentioned, you lived in Alaska, you lived in Germany. Oh yeah. So you so were a traveler. Yeah. It, it ramped up really quickly. It seems like after that. So um, he told me the story of, he was working at a hotel um, he can't remember which one because anytime me and him are driving together, he's like, I think it's that brand, but it might have been that brand. But um, <laughs> essentially, he was the night clean cleanup crew for this hotel. Um, and he thought he was making millions of dollars. And because for him, a dollar at that point was like incredible. So he's like, oh, I'm doing great. He picked up a second job at a McDonald's. Um, and then my uncle was kind of talking to him because my uncle had already enlisted in the U.S. Army. Um, and he was just like, have you ever considered this? Thought about it? He goes, like yeah sign me up how do i do it um so he literally just went later that day and enlisted in the u.s army um they went ahead he did his basic training and all that good stuff and our first duty station was fairbanks alaska so this family from nicaragua that at that point my mother did not speak much english at all my dad he was working really hard taking english classes with a friend that he had met at work um so trying to adapt as much as he can um, in order to kind of move forward with this career um, but he got sent and he was away and within his first year had to go to some training. Um, so it was myself as a good one year old, maybe of that, mm -hmm. um, my sister turning three years old and my mother who barely spoke English in Alaska, um, of all places where, you know, a year earlier she had been in Nicaragua. So she went from 90 degrees year round to Alaska. Um, so it was a very radical <laughs> change for my family at that point. Uh, we only spent a short time there. So unfortunately, I don't have very many memories. Um, I do have some tiny, tiny memories. I was um, between the ages of one and three we spent in Alaska. Um, and I just remember walls of snow. It's probably because I was so small. So everything looked like walls of snow. Um, but I do distinctly remember that. Um, but then we finally got our first like main duty station. And that was Frankfurt, Germany. And so my father flew ahead to kind of get everything settled. Um, and then he sent for us. We flew over there and we arrived in Frankfurt, Germany. I was three. My sister was five. My mother, um, again, now she had finally, she's been on her own a lot at this point. So she had started taking English classes as well. So she was able to kind of get us around and navigate that. Um, but when I think back to those times, I don't think myself as a human could be strong enough to do something right. like what they did. Because it's, it's terrifying to really like, I've, I've been to other countries now as an adult and I've flown around and it's difficult to navigate in, you know, 2020, 2021, 22, three, four, all that good stuff. Um, with all the technology we have now, I could not imagine in the early nineties trying to do all that, not speaking the language, probably not having the funds to, to supply it, but they were able to do that. Got us to Germany. Um, we lived in Frankfurt, Germany for a total of a calendar year, exactly on the dot before they moved us over to Heidelberg, Germany. Um, which Heidelberg, Germany is where we spent the next eight years. Um, and that's kind of my home, if I had to call anywhere home. So that's kind of one of the weird things about being a military brat is what what is home to all of us. Um, at this point, Clarksville, Tennessee might be more home than anything. I've been here for so long. Um, mm -hmm. But that is where my upbringing was, was in Heidelberg, Germany. So do you think that that uh, experience as being uh, a son of a, a military person that is transient like that, that you um, you adapted to um, meeting new people, 
because I'm sure there was constant, you know, new people in your life, new friends, new experiences, new things that, uh, you know, m people in the U.S. maybe not grown up, did not experience. Oh, 100 percent. Um, that I always I look back and laugh about it now. I was always sad as a as a kid because I would watch these movies and TV shows and they would grow up in the same neighborhood and they would have these like, you know, trick or treating was always such a big deal for me. And I was like, man, that must be so cool to like live in this like neighborhood where, you know, everybody and you trick or treat and they, you all grow up as best friends together, like the Goonies and all, all those things. I I always wanted that life. Um, but instead, I lived on a military base in Heidelberg, Germany, where, you know, every year my best friend would move away. So it was always a consistent, like the job was always open. Uh, so it's like, hey, new friend coming in, new friend coming in. Um, and then school was constantly like that. So I didn't really realize that until I moved over to Clarksville was that people don't move away that often. That's not normal. That's that's a very concentrated population, especially going to school on an army base where like you, you aren't supposed to get new students every week. Like that's not normal at all. <laughs> um, but I thought that was just like, yeah, no, like our class, this is how we start. But this is definitely not how we're going to end. We're going to get new students every week and new people from all over the world. And um, it, that that auto diversity, too, was very strange to me because I never considered diversity as a student. Like it was just like, oh, yeah, it's I'm from Nicaragua. They're from Puerto Rico. They're from Ireland. That person's from Russia. All of us are just we're here in this classroom. Um, so that was kind of a, a weird thing that I never realized that I got exposed to as a child. And so I kind of reflected back on my time of that. I was like, you know, it's, it it seems like I. I felt at that time I was missing out on a lot, but I didn't realize how much I was actually experiencing. So, That's right. the, yeah, the things that, you know, that I took for granted at that point were actually super, super valuable. Um, and so I loved my time there. Um, unfortunately, I did find out that the uh, base where we lived shut down a few years back. Um, so I have uh, found some pictures, looked back at it. So I could not actually go back and ever visit where I grew up because it is completely locked down. Um, but there's somebody who snuck in and took a bunch of pictures of the old places where, I mean, I used to go eat lunch, my elementary school, my middle school, um, the playground where we all grew up playing soccer together and things like that. Um, so those memories are kind of trapped in that generation. Um, they've done nothing with that area. It's just kind of locked off right now. So it's kind of a time capsule of, of sorts. Wow. So you, you, when you came back to the U S and uh, you came to Clarksville you talked about that you eventually went to Northeast High School, mm -hmm. I think. Yes, yes. And what kind of things did you like to do? What kind of activities were you involved in? Yeah, so at Northeast High School, um, I don't actually remember the origin of how I fell into it. Um, but I fell into auditioning for what we call Eagle News Network. Um, and to me, this was the absolute coolest thing you could be a part of in high school. It was the who's who's. Um, so every Friday during our fourth period, um, right before lunch, they would broadcast this to the entire school. And it was a 15 to 20 minute, almost Saturday Night Live style kind of sketch show. Um, sometimes it was informative of like, hey, it's the beginning of the school year. Remember, follow these rules. Doom, doom, doom. But they would do it in a fun, lighthearted way. Um, but then there was a duo that they had at that point when I was a freshman, two seniors, um, that put together their own series. They created a series then um, where they were their own made up superheroes and they would go fight crime. Um, and it was the cheesiest, corniest, um, you know, most high school thing ever. But to me at that point, I was like, I need to do that. I want to do that more than life itself. Mm -hmm. um, so those two indirectly kind of inspired me to like, hey, I want to audition for this next year. Um, so I auditioned for it. I got picked up as a sophomore. Um, I was one of two sophomores in that course that was allowed to be in there. Um, everybody else was a junior, senior level. So I was already like, okay, I'm fish out of water here. I've got to prove myself it's kind of quick. Um, the first time they let me do something on my own and let me be creative, I absolutely bombed. It was maybe the worst <laughs> piece of content the teacher at that point had ever seen. Um, so we had went on a field trip to the Memphis Zoo, actually, uh, which me and you were just at not too long ago. Um, so that, that was memories of me walking around there. I was like, cool. Last time I was here, it did not go well. <laughs> um, but I decided to have my buddy um, record me going around and interviewing all of the animals. <laughs> I thought this was the funniest sketch that I could oh, ever come Lord. up with at that point. And nobody could tell me any different. My buddy agreed. He was laughing behind the camera. Um, we went back into editing. We're just laughing and crying. And we're like, this is it. This is going to put us like we are going to be stars. Um, 
on Thursday afternoon in that class, we would meet and we would watch everybody's stuff before putting it out to the broadcast the next day. Um, the teacher went ahead and hit pause halfway through because we had to use video back then. Um, he hit pause on the video, turned the lights on in the class and said, that's not going to air. And I was like, why, why not? And she was like, that is terrible. It is you rambling on for six minutes about absolutely nothing. And I was like, it's funny. It's great. It's comedy. Um, I think in today's world and TikTok, that would have been a viral hit. Um, in 2006, that was not good. That was not comedy. So that was my first moment of like, oh, I've got to work a little bit harder. I've got to study. I've got to to learn the nuances of, of what this really is. Um, and so I, I, I took my took my beating pretty well. Um, it was a while before I was allowed to lead a project after that. Um, but I, I was able to kind of humble myself and I was appreciative of that moment. Um, and I still am very good friends with that teacher to this day. Uh, her name is Miss Pollyanna Parker. Um, she is an absolute superstar of a human being, almost like a second mother to me during my time at high school. Um, because of that tough love she showed me, I, I knew she cared about me, not just growing up as a person, but growing up as a video editor, as a broadcaster. Um, so after that, we we were able to have just an honest relationship. And because of that, I grew so much more and was able to push myself so much more because I knew if I didn't produce something of the expectations she had for me, she would be honest with me and say, no, that's not your good work. You you can do much better than that. So I, I love that relationship that we developed in that class. Um, other sure. things that I did outside of Eagle News Network, I also um, participated in varsity soccer all four years of, of high school there. Uh, not a huge sport at Northeast High School, a, a school that is proud in tradition in um, men's and women's basketball and um, football um and men's baseball as well they've produced many players who've gone on to have professional careers and, and great careers in all those sports so soccer was never a highly touted or highly attended sport by any means um but it was a good time i'm still really good friends with a lot of those um, my head coach from that point i am now coaching his daughter um so that is a full circle moment for us wow. now that he gets to now be the uh, the parent standing on the sideline while i am the one um, head coaching his daughter's soccer team Nice. And, it, you know, I was just thinking about your teacher as uh, you you told that story that she may have saved you some uh, some personal humiliation from your uh, <laughs> fellow high school uh, class as well. Um, but uh, did you realize at some point or when did you realize that you had this extroverted personality, this ability to, you know, put yourself out there to shine, to be in front of us? Because that's I mean, that takes a lot of courage. It does. It does. Um, so it started around sixth grade. So me and my sister bored at the airport one day, a couple of years back, we started kind of talking about that because she was like, you are a strange case because up until about fifth grade, I was a very quiet kid, just normal, quiet, very rule following. Um, I was very well behaved. I, I would not break outside of the norm. Um, and then in sixth grade, it just kind of one day just manifested um I, I kind of mentioned to you before that um i was a really big wrestling fan at that time um and for anybody who, who knows anything about the wrestling landscape the late 90s was a huge boom in wrestling oh, yeah. uh, of big characters of the stone cold steve austins of the world and the rock was a, a huge character back then um and so i was an influential little eight nine ten year old watching these guys these larger than life characters on tv every week and i was like I like that. I like this larger than life. So I think I almost developed this character of Hondro um, on its own. Um, kind of the origin story, which I don't talk about this very often. So this is kind of an exclusive for you right now. Um, the origin story of Hondro. Prior to moving to Clarksville, I was only known as Alex. So that was my name, Alex. Um, Alejandro is Alexander in English. Um, and so my parents always kind of a family thing. They just called me Alex. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm Alex. Um, my fifth grade year prior to moving to Clarksville, there was three Alex's in my class. And I was like, oh, this is getting, this is too much. I'm, I'm just somebody else. I'm just another person. I'm the third Alex. I'm not even the second Alex. Like I'm third in the rankings here. This is not good. Um, so <laughs> once we moved, um, my best friend in Germany, he would, he gave me the nickname Hondro. He just called me that randomly one day. And I was like, I like it. It's unique. It's different. People know who I am. Um, so when I moved over to um, Clarksville and the first day I was at Northeast Middle School and they were like, so what's your name? And I was like, Hondro, that's my name. 
And my sister kind of just looked at me and she goes, no, you're not. You're Alex. And I was like, <laughs> I am Hondro now. Um, I have reinvented myself. This is my character. This is who I'm going to be. Um, and I think that was kind of the the genesis of who I became kind of a, it was a, a mixture of all these characters that I've always seen um, along with who my best friend in Germany thought I was. So it's, I put together that person and now it's manifested into who I am all these years later. Yeah, that's a, that's a great story and a great example of sometimes that we um, we can project who we want to be, who we imagine we can be, and we then grow into that role. I mean, it, that's exactly, I mean, is, and again, speaking to somebody who has an unusual name, <laughs> you know, that, that it was the same thing, that I could be very unique as this character of Buzz, as you also uh and talked about putting on this role of Hondro, which yes. is, <laughs> which serves you so well. So um, you graduated and you decided to attend Austin P. Um, and we've already kind of given a little bit of a clue, but uh, were you, so you had initially you thought I'm going to be a sports broadcaster. Yes, yes. So okay. um, after doing my ENN, my my Eagle News Network in high school, um, I was looking for the best broadcasting, the editing. Um, at that point, I thought that I was one of the best students in the nation at using Final Cut Pro. I thought there was very few people that were graduating from high school that could compete with me That's when it true. comes to video editing and whatnot. Um, and my teacher did a good job at um, building up my confidence, but also like humbling me at the same time. So she was like, yes, you are really, really, really talented at that. Um, but there is a lot to still learn. Like you scratch the surface of this. And I was just like, I think I've gotten a little past the surface. You don't realize how strong I am and all that. Uh, so I was looking at for a school with this program. Um, at that point, I had looked at Austin P, Middle Tennessee and Western Kentucky because um, I was like, oh, we have three programs kind of in this region. And, and so um, I had settled on Austin P because I thought, number one, I would get the best hands on experience from day one. Um, so that was kind of the, the, the big game changer for me was. Um, I talked to two friends that were previously in the program that had attended Middle Tennessee. And they're like, yeah, no, it's like, it's it's a good program, but it's not going to give you what you want. I was like, huh? And they're like, we know you, dude. You're going to want to be like big dog from day one. I was like, I mean, yeah, essentially. And they're like, you have to wait in line here. I was like, oh, I'm not waiting in line. That, that's yeah. just not happening in a million years. Um, and then I had talked to a couple of people that attended Austin P. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, from day one, if you want to like try to take over things, you're going to have the opportunity to. Um, which fast forward, come to find out, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. There's a lot of talent um, here at Austin P. Um, I thought I was going to come in and be the Michael Jordan of broadcasting um, back then. And I thought I was going to come in and revolutionize everything. Um, no, there was there was people doing great work at that time in 2008. And I and I learned that really quickly after hanging out with some of the upperclassmen. But yeah, came here, um, decided to enroll in the sports broadcasting program, which I think was towards the infancy of that program. It was very, very early in the years when um, it actually became a full degree program. I think it started off as a uh, minor or less than that. Um, but at that point, it moved into a full degree program. Um, so I was excited about that. I was like, I get to stay in my backyard. I get to be somewhere I'm familiar with um, and go for the degree that I really want to pursue. Um, then that kind of changed over the years as um, I started realizing through different classes that we were taking that you start off as a journalist covering high school football games usually. Um, and you do that for many, many, many years as you earn your stripes um, in order to move up. And after doing research on a couple of projects, thankful to the, the sports broadcasting program here for having me do this research on these projects and um, researching what your career would want to be. And then I realized that most, if not every personality, the big dogs on um, ESPN, the Tony Kornheisers, the Michael Wilbons, they did 30 years of coverage before they even got any break to ever be on major ESPN television. I was like, 30 years back then, you know, when you're 20 years old, 30 years sounds like yeah. the end of the year. Like, you're like, I I'm going to be too old to be on TV. Nobody's going to want to hear from me then. <laughs> uh, little did I know how fast time goes then. Um, but no, yeah. So that it almost intimidated me out of the industry because I was like, I don't know if I have that in me to to wait that long. Um, and then some other doors opened up here at the university as well. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your favorite memories as a student, though, because mm -hmm. I always like I think that's interesting. You talked about um, that you uh, I, was it your freshman year with three, six mafia. Yes. Yes. So we had a rap concert here um, that year and it was early in the fall semester. 
Um, it was located inside the Dunn, or not inside the Dunn, it was inside the Foy Fitness Center on the basketball courts. It was a free concert to all. Um, and so I had a couple friends from high school that we were still buddies then. And we're like, hey, yeah, let's go to the concert. Let's figure out what it's all about. And I was expecting something kind of very mild. Um, it was the like eye-opening moment of like, oh my God, this is college. So we walk in, it is as crowded as it can be. Um, now working on this side of things, God bless whoever was working that event and in charge of that event because, wow, um, there was a lot, a lot of things going on there that I'm sure behind the scenes they were not happy about or, mm -hmm. or kind of overwhelmed about because um, it was definitely at capacity or over a little bit. Um, but I, I show up here as an 18-year-old, bright-eyed kind of freshman, and I'm like, I'm here partying with upperclassmen, and they're having a great time, and this is college, and it's like, you know, there's no school uniforms or, you know, teachers telling us to like back away and then everyone's so excited. And at that point, 3-6 Mafia was a pretty successful rap group in the music industry. Um, so everybody was very excited to sing. Ooh, there go, blurring away. Um, but they were a very successful rap group that had the opportunity to, um, that everybody had listened to. It was very famous. And so everyone was super excited about that to be here on campus at Austin P. And it was one of those like, okay, I made the right choice. I came, I'm getting the right education. I'm having the right social life. Like this is awesome. This is college at its like peak. Like, I don't know how these next three years are going to get better than this. Um, they continuously did, but it, it was an awesome moment for sure that, that I'll always remember that feeling of excitement that day. Yeah. You also mentioned that you loved going to basketball games and, and uh, you worked many a basketball game <laughs> and yes. you didn't see it as work, which is, uh, I, I now that uh, I'm going to tell you that uh, I was a sports broadcasting professor, I would have loved uh, another, you know, 10 Hondros like you. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So um, if I was at the basketball game, nine times out of 10, I was working um, or trying to sign up to work for it um, because I really genuinely enjoyed being part of the crew. Um, yeah. I thought that that team camaraderie, um, us coming together to put together a broadcast um, to put together, you know, you know, record the little kid dancing and put them up on the on the big board and, and all that great stuff. I, I love that. I love being a part of somebody's memories for that event. That's right. Because um, to me, it was awesome to be basketball and I can come whenever I felt like it. But I, I realized for other people, this could be a special night out. This could be a big core memory for them. And I felt like I was a part of that. Now, some people would be like, oh, no, you're just on one camera. Um, but I thought my camera had a lot of power. And I think that's what always attracted me to broadcasting was each and every camera has so much power. And I think now in the social media age, we've seen that more than ever, uh, right. where one person gets on camera for five seconds and they're instantly almost a celebrity. They're, they're a, they blow up out of nowhere. Um, there was a lady this past season with the San Diego Chargers football game. She was put on broadcast three times for a total of maybe 12 seconds. And the very next Monday, she is all over social media. Who is this person? What are they? They are such a passionate fan. And I, and I love that. I think that's the power of the camera. No one thinks about the person on the other side of the camera who made that happen. Um, so there, I think there's a lot of power and excitement on the, the broadcast team. So they get the opportunity to, to highlight you in your highest moment when your team is winning. And then also to kind of show you at your lowest moment when your team, you know, just barely lost when you thought that opportunity was there. So that the ability to capture all that emotion um, with a piece of hardware, I think that, that's exciting. And people, I, I know I'm probably, I think about it in a way deeper lens than some people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's that's what excites me about broadcasting in general is that it has the power to do that, to move people. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I, I, I tell, I write a little message to all the accepted students. And one of the messages for com communication students is you are a storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, and you get to, you get to create and communicate this story to um, people for their enjoyment. And uh, and just as you said, you know, the, the tough thing with sports is it becomes so emotional. It's hard <laughs> as a as a fan of Austin P not to also be, you know, personally invested in it. You have to set you learn to separate yourself sometimes. I mean, there's sometimes where there's bleed over, but uh, yeah. it's very hard for a college student to learn that. Oh, it is. It is. I think that's the hardest skill because there's no step one, step two, step three to learning that skill. It's experience, essentially. You 
you you think you're prepared you're like oh yeah i don't get emotional and then you are you know the score is 86 to 86 with three seconds to go and austin p has the ball driving against murray state university and you're just like oh wait i'm on camera right now oh, oh gotta focus again <laughs> um because you're you're so busy watching and you're stuck in the moment but you got to realize that you're also live to so many people trying to capture that moment as well um so you've got to be like you said the storyteller to make sure that you are capturing the moment in a way where they can appreciate it as well so can't be too close zoomed in and you can't get you know got to get the atmosphere in there um so there's a lot to really think of so you do have to almost move in slow motion while everything is speeding past you so you um at some point uh before graduation you must have had an internship with admissions were you also um, providing tours before then or did you do that as part of your internship yeah so i was hired on as a govs ambassador um, after my sophomore year at austin p um, which the govs ambassador program is the campus tour guides um they kind of fit in my personality and i thought career-wise at that oh, point sure that <laughs> I thought in like career wise, it would help me because I'm, I'm working on my voice. I'm working on broadcasting, on projecting. I thought this makes perfect sense. Direct career experience. This is good. This is where I need to be. Um, another kind of side story was I did not have the GPA to be hired at that point. Um, so a um, friend of mine who was also in the comm department, but he was in the PR department specifically, um, he went and spoke with the assistant director at that point who is the current associate provost that we have down here. And he said, hey, um, this guy's really good and you need him. He just had a really bad semester uh, during his freshman year that set his GPA a little low, but talk to him, consider taking a chance on him. I'm putting my name on the line for him. And you know, I'm very grateful to him to this day um, for doing that for me because essentially he, he jump-started my career and I didn't even realize it. Um, so through that hiring me of being in the Govs Ambassadors program, um, I ended up doing an internship. They needed a little help with, at that point, it was called AP Day, but now it is Govs Preview Day. Um, they just needed a little extra assistance. And I was like, yeah, no, I'd love to do it. Like, I'd love to be in the office, get, get to work with people, help them on their journey. Um, this sounds great. And so after working that internship that semester, I was like, I can see myself doing this. Like, I think I can have a career in this and a successful career in this, not just walk in here and kind of just live the next 30 years of my life. But this is something somewhere where I feel inspired and motivated to constantly do more. Um, and so after that, I would almost a borderline call it harassment, ask around the office of, Hey, is a job coming open? Is anyone quitting anytime soon? You should promote so-and-so. So there'd be a job for me. Um, and then the conversation starts turning. I was like, okay, if you're not going to hire me, maybe you can make me a GA at least, please keep me around here. I, I, I just love being around here. Um, I was a pest at that point. I know I was. They never called me a pest. They they tolerated me the best they could. Um, but I bothered them. It had to be every single day until finally I saw that um, one of the admissions counselors at the time was leaving. Um, and I was like, can you please not leave until I graduate? Can you please hold off a couple of weeks? I don't want them to hire somebody else. Um, and just the timeline just happened to fall all together. Um, luckily, after interviewing, um, they had two job openings at the same time, so I was able to secure one of those jobs. Well, that that door opened for you, um, which I think is, you know, uh, I think that the spirit does those kind of things for people. And my um, what what I want our listeners and our viewers to know is that our comm students have so many tools in their tool belt that they are able to do so many different things, even though you came in as a sports broadcaster and and. Truthfully, Hondro, I know that if you had continued on in that and decided to stick it out, you would have been successful in that. But you also had these skills, these person, these you're so personable that um, that certainly translated very well with all the uh, things that you could do, all the, the, the abilities that you have. And and uh, certainly that that was very um, beneficial for Austin P um, <laughs> to have that. Um so you you started at, you started at the bottom, yeah. um, as and and then but you have progressed through. I think you you talked about um, you became in in charge of orientation. Mm -hmm. uh, you became a coordinator. Um, all those kind of things. You just kept saying yes. Yeah, no, I I have a problem with that. I, <laughs> I genuinely have a problem with that. Um, I will say yes. I see my 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 personality as a battery. 
um, I will say yes until I hit 1%. Um, mm. So if I have 2 or 3% to give, then I'm, I'm going to give you 2 or 3%. I will go until I hit zero, absolutely zero. Um, then I have like a two-day like crash out of, <laughs> I need to go lay on the couch and watch reality TV or something just to take my brain. <laughs> I say reality TV, it's never reality TV. It's always a YouTube video about some conspiracy theory because that just kind of resets my, my mental battery. <laughs> um, but yes, no, I, I continue to say yes. So I started off as an admissions counselor and I was hired on to be the admissions counselor for East Tennessee. And so at that point, what that meant was I would spend six to eight weeks each semester traveling to Knoxville and beyond um, to go kind of recruit for Austin Peay State University, just to go talk and say, you know, this is what we have, this is what we're, you know, what are you interested in? How can we get you to Austin Peay? Um, and through those conversations, I was like, I really do like this. Like, I, I enjoy my job. Some days it was exhausting. Um, There's multiple college fairs out there that were three, four, five hours long. Um, and I wouldn't get home until 10 or 11 p.m. Um, but it was always rewarding because the job turn or turnover of each student was so quick. It was, I would meet you in August. And by that March, April, I was seeing you at orientation, everything like that. So it was almost instant gratification in a way of like, I just met this student. We just had a conversation. We weren't sure where this was going. And now look where it came. Um, one of my favorite stories that I still love to this day um, is um, as a recruiter, I was at a college fair at um, Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge High School, in, right outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, Oak Ridge, great school for STEM students, um, fantastic program there. Um, but I remember meeting one student specifically, um, and he actually came and was part of the communications program. Uh, it, his name was Tristan Henderson. And so I had the sure. opportunity to meet Tristan as a young high school student his junior year, um, and this loud, over the top, um, students, I'm going to Austin Peay. I'm going to, I was like, I'm sure you are, bud. Like, like, we're going to make this happen. Like, you know, like he comes back a senior year. I've been accepted to Austin Peay. And I'm like, okay, we're moving. We're moving. He's like, I got a scholarship. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be part of the, the theater program. It's like, okay, awesome. Awesome. Um, then I saw him come for orientation. I was like, this is really happening. Like he, he spoke this two years ago and he is here and has made this happen. He is in total control of his life. Um, then when he came here, I hired him as a tour guide as well, because I, I've known this kid for two years now. I've seen him. His personality is real. It is genuinely him. Um, and now, um, fast forward to 2024, um, he just got his debut on Broadway. So, I mean, from that conversation we had and the gym in Oak Ridge High School um, when I was eating Chick-fil-A chicken nuggets to we fast forward and I'm looking on social media and he's posting about how excited he is to make his debut on Broadway. I'm like, that's incredible. That's incredible. And it all starts kind of with that door being open um, from a college fair that Austin Peay was at that's four hours away from campus. So it's it's definitely a rewarding job. And it has its moments where you get to, especially if you're a person whose cup is filled by watching others succeed, they, I, I can't think of a better job for, for um, anybody. Um, it, it's just so awesome. And it, and it fills me and it makes me like excited right now to think like he is living his dreams. And it kind of came through this pipeline. Like we we helped facilitate that um, and kind of nurture that talent that he already had. Um, and he went on and now, you know, to say he's on Broadway, I mean, he's in his early 20s and he's already reached kind of the pinnacle of that of that industry. You know, to get on Broadway, I think, you know, there's probably a handful of people in human history who can say if they've officially performed on Broadway in New York um, and he already gets to, to live that dream. Yeah. And he's also been on this podcast before. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, so, a, a, a great, great student, um, great human being um, and an and incredible performer. Well, it's obvious that you you find a way to quickly connect with a, with those students. And that's that's a, a wonderful ability to find some way to to connect with somebody. And it's. And I mean, that's that's a, a skill that it, I, I think sometimes is not uh, some that can be learned. Yeah, no, no it, it definitely is a tool that needs sharpening quite often, um, because as humans evolve, um, <laughs> you have to always kind of continue to find the way to to connect. Right. Um, you know, I thought that was always my my pride and joy when I was a young admissions counselor was. I'm able to connect because like I'm young and I'm hip and I'm cool. You know it. Yeah. <laughs> and then as I continue to get older and older, um, there's never a moment, and I always joke about this and when I talk to large groups, there's never a moment when people tell you you're not cool anymore. No one officially tells you, it just happens. You just have the moment when 
you are not what is considered cool anymore. Um, and my moment happened, it came and went and passed. And I was like, okay, and now I need to find my way to be cool in my role. Um, so I don't need to be what is the my old kind of definition of cool. I need to be cool in this role. How can I be the cool guy in admissions? Not just a cool guy, but how can I be cool while being a mentor? How can I be cool while being a role model? Um, so it's just the transition into what that definition is. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And in fact, it, there, it comes with a qualifier with those students now that they, for an older guy, mm -hmm. he's cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yep. That is, that is the line right there. And at first I was like, what do you, what, what do you mean for an old? And now I'm just like, yeah, you're right. You know what? I, I am <laughs> for my demographic, mm -hmm. for my division. I am cool. I, I, I fit, I fit the narrative. <laughs> so be beyond that, um, uh, in terms of that, what other things have, have been, f you you know, I, I know you talked about some of the great joys, but um, as you progressed through leadership, uh, you know, what other challenges have you faced? Um, I think the hardest one, and I joke with my supervisor about this all the time, is there's never a real manual on how to manage people. Mm -hmm. I don't think right. there's a an official way to because there's no set in stone one size fits all. Um, I did a master's degree in higher education and student personnel. Everything I learned in my master's degree was incredible, great program. Um, but at no point did they ever talk about managing staff. Um, and so I thought I was prepared to manage. Um, and there was a lot of bumps along the way. And still to this day, I'm still kind of learning. I think that's one thing that I consistently want to look back and reflect on is how can I consistently be a better manager for my staff? Um, and I think, and I would hope that I can continue growing on that and I don't ever settle on that because the big thing is people change. You know, um, I am now hiring um, Gen Z. So hiring Gen Z is a, a whole different ball field than you know when I came in, when I First took over this position, um, I had a lot of millennials, I had a lot of Gen X, um, but no Gen Z. And so now I am running an office where I have, you know, somebody who is Gen X, you know, quite a few millennials. And then now we have a good handful of Gen Z in our office. So trying to balance a staff meeting with that many personality ranges um, who look at work in different lights as well. You know, there's the I live to work. There's the I work to live. There's the I'm just here. Please don't fire me. I just need this paycheck. Um, so there's all of those different kind of people that you're trying to manage um, and make sure that they all get along as well, because we're a team at the end of the day. Uh, we have one mission. We have one goal together. Um, and that is to, you know, make sure that the enrollment of the university um, stays consistent and stays growing. Um, so to, to get all of those brains and all of those different minds going in the same direction and to explain to this staff member, why this staff member is doing what they're doing and thinking the way they're thinking and that they're both correct. Um, yeah. I, that is a difficult, difficult skill. Um, and one, I would not say is sharp yet, um, but it every single day it, it tries to improve. Um, so that's kind of the excitement I think of my current role is I have to get better every day. I can't come to work and just coast. I always have to work towards it um, to ensure that my team is as happy as they can. Yeah, something you, you mentioned earlier in the broadcast, which makes me think about my own experiences is that uh, sometimes I think working in a college environment is like um, a being in a bit of a neverland, uh, you know, with Peter Pan and, and the Lost Boys and the fact that, uh, you know, we're always in with young people. So we it's never like growing up. I mean, even though we continue to age, <laughs> they do not. Um, mm -hmm. So there's something about the uh, excitement, as you had mentioned, the enjoyment of seeing young people at the very beginning of their their uh, experiences and how they personally grow until graduation, which you and I had mentioned uh, that you work so many <laughs> uh, graduations while you're in the communication department of seeing them through that part of this part of their life journey and how exciting that is. Correct. Correct. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And I, I think. You know, that is the excitement of working at a college campus. Um, I think a lot of people would look at you and I and be like, you guys are crazy to deal with. You know, a lot of people think the the moodiest or the most you know, like opinionated of generations of students is you catch them right after high school, right before they go into the career path. There's there's a lot of emotions to that we're managing here. Um, but I think when you understand that emotion and when you listen to these students, 
you realize that most of the time it's coming from a really, really good place. Um, and they have never been able to express themselves. So then watching them come here and realize that they are allowed to express themselves and we're going to actually help them express themselves um, is really reassuring because you get a student who comes here with like, eh, I, don't, I don't know about this. And by the time they're a junior, senior, it's, you know, full speed ahead. This is who I am. I am proud of who I am. I'm confident in who I am. You know, look out world. Here I come. So our last question that we always ask our guests, Hondro, is uh, what kind of recommendations do you have? I know you probably give this advice at all times to parents as well as uh, young people. Um, what kind of advice would you have? Yep. Um, my, I think my main piece of advice would be um, college is a fresh start. Um, kind of circling back to the beginning where I became you know, the genesis of Hondro and my fresh start was moving to Clarksville, Tennessee. Um, I think it's the same thing with coming to college. Um, and I speak from that from a personal perspective of I made the transition from high school to college and I didn't use it as a fresh start my first year. My first year, I continued kind of being the same person I was and I was not finding the same success. I think it is very important to use this as a true fresh start and say, here are my goals. Here's what I want to get out of this experience. How can I get there? Um, and to you know become the person you really want to be for the rest of your life. This is going to be the beginning of professional you. This is going to be the beginning of the career version of you. So whether it's going to be in a sports broadcasting field, in a public relations field, um, in a you know theater field like Treston, um, this is the moment you are starting to develop that character. So kind of step into this world as this is chapter one of this character of my life. Um, and then enjoy the ride, enjoy the story. Uh, you, the story's gonna have its ups, it's gonna have its downs, but that's what's gonna shape you into, into who you are. Uh, one of my favorite things that I always remember, one of the favorite quotes that sticks with me is, you can't appreciate those sunny days until you have those rainy days. And so enjoy those rainy days, let those rainy days come, um, sit under that rain and let it fall all over mm -hmm. you because that next sunny day is gonna be so beautiful, it's gonna be so great. So, you know, just enjoy the change, enjoy, embrace the change um, and, and use it, use it. Well, for those that um, have not had a chance to see you in action, I would say um, you are one of the most dynamic and 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 really uh, exciting uh, presenters. And we're so glad and fortunate to have you um, working for Austin P. And uh, it's a, it's a great benefit to the university. We are thankful for your uh, abilities, using your abilities here. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. And I love being here. Like I said, gum at the bottom of the shoe. I don't plan on going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> All right. Great. And thanks for being on the podcast today. No, thank you for having me. I had a blast. This, there's no way this was a full hour right now, but looking at the clock, <laughs> we just talked for a full hour. No problem. So I love it. It was a great Two time. people that like to talk are getting yeah. together. That's yep, right. Yep. <laughs> and thanks to all our viewers and listeners out there for checking out the podcast. We hope you will join us again as we continue to profile some of our outstanding alumni we have in the College of Arts and Letters here at Austin P State University. So until next time, stay safe, take care, and God bless.